All right, so hi everybody. Um, welcome, thank you for joining us. My name is Darby Malvi. I am Programming and Outreach Coordinator for Library Link NJ. Um, and today's skill sharing conversation is on genrefying your library collection. And we are thrilled to have with us sort of moderating our conversation and leading our discussion, um, Lisa Straubinger. Lisa is the teacher librarian at T. Baldwin Demarest School in Old Tapan and also a past president of the New Jersey Association of School Librarians. Um, and Lisa's gonna get us started, kick us off, let us know what she's up to with genrefying. Um, but this is a conversation. So, you know, be ready to share and talk and ask questions and give each other advice because that is what we are here for. Um, so Lisa, do you wanna take it away for now? Okay, thank you, Darby. Hi all, um, so I am a pre-K four uh, teacher librarian. Prior to that, I taught second grade, I taught third grade, I was the tech teacher. Now I'm responsible for both. And um, I have to be honest, I was completely against genrefying. I'm like, no, the kids need a system. Do we make sense? This is how we find the books. How are we gonna use the OPAC system if they can't, you know, they're not gonna be able to locate the books, blah, blah, blah. And then I was listening to a podcast this summer. I wanna say, it was one with Amy Herman. If you don't listen to the schools, School Librarians United podcast, add it to your list. It's fantastic. It's called School Librarians United. Um, and Kelsey Bogan is a high school librarian in uh, outside of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And she said something to the effect of, we're not teaching the kids how to use Dewey, we're teaching the kids how to use the OPEC system. And as long as they understand what the the, the um, call number says and how that translates to your shelves, that's what we want them to learn. That's the skill because honestly, even within Dewey, some books are classified differently. St depending on the library you go to, the, the books can be found in different places. And that was my light bulb moment. I went, oh my gosh, that's what it is. I'm teaching them how to search. I'm not teaching them a specific system. And I was just saying to Darby before, I also couldn't take it anymore when, can I have a princess book? And then I would have to go to 20 different places to pull all the princess books so they could look at the princess books to see what they wanted. And it, it was just time consuming with the 45 minute period that I have with the kids. And that was actually before I even did anything with my collection. Last year, we pulled all the princess books and just put them in one place. And then we pulled all the unicorn and mermaid and magical creature books. And those all went in one place because that's what kept getting asked for over and over again. And so I am very lucky. Um, my district does provide us with R&D over the summer. So I was given, I applied for, I believe, 20 hours and I was paid for the time that I put in. Um, so that is definitely a benefit of my district. And all I genrefied this summer was my picture book section. I have not touched anything else. And I will tell you that took all 20 of the hours and I still have work to do. Um, it is time consuming, but in the long run, it makes life so much easier. I, I kind of equate it to keyboarding, right? Like when you're first learning the keyboard, hunting and pecking feels like it's fast, but when you actually learn the keyboard, that's so much faster and it's the same thing. Like the, the beginning is painful, but the end results are definitely worthwhile. Um, it, it circulation increases because the kids can find what they're looking for. And also the kids can find bookalikes easier too. So if they like a particular type of book, instead of always taking out, um, you know, the same unicorn book over and over again, they can see all of them together. If it's older kids, and I included, um, I made a wakelet that I will share with you with some resources in it. Kelsey Bogan just had another podcast this past weekend with Amy Herman as a follow-up on the genrefication. And she also made another great point that, you know, if your kids like fantasy, and they're taking out Harry Potter and Rick Riordan, Harry Potter and Rick Riordan, Harry Potter and Rick Riordan, because they don't know what else if all your fantasy books are together now they can see oh here's harry potter here's rick reading oh this is in the same section as them maybe i might like this maybe this would be a book for me so that is kind of the onus behind why why i'm doing it um or why i did it i started with that my next section that i was going to tackle are the biographies again um 
we always pull the who was, who was, who was, and those are great. They're awesome. But I have so many beautiful picture book biographies and so many other kinds of series that the kids just grab the same thing. And I want to make it so that they're seeing what else is there and make it easy for them to see what else is there. Um, I would say that also dynamic shelving kind of goes hand in hand with the genrefication that once you do genrefy you also want to think about the way that you display your books um, to grab the kids so that they can see what it is that they're looking for but that that's a whole nother topic on itself you could probably do one of these meetings just on dynamic shelving um oh, there was one more thing i was just going to say and i, I drew a blank oh and the, really, the thing you need to do first before you do anything else is weed. You have to weed and get rid of those books that never go out, that are moldy, that are torn, that are to make the space for what you're going to do. Because basically, uh, well, you know what, before I go into what I did, how about you all take a moment, share who you are, um, if you're a public librarian, a school librarian, and why you're here today. Like, what brought you to learn more about genrefication? Who'd like to go first? <laughs> I'll go first. Um, okay, I'm yeah. basically here to lurk and hear what you all have to say. Uh, we have a small library opening next year, and everyone keeps throwing around the idea of doing a bookstore model. So we're actually talking about more like genrefying the adult nonfiction. So just hearing what other people have done for kids, I just want to see what little snippets I can pull in and kind of do there. We're not, we will have kids materials, but they're gonna be so small that genrefying it would probably be very difficult. Um, we can break some things out. It's more gonna be like format, like early readers and picture books and fiction. So just trying to get some ideas of what we can do in that space by genrefying it. Okay, thank you, Yvonne. I'm Joanne Wells. Let me put my video on. Your video is on, Joanne. You're Thank good. you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, and I work in a K through three library. And yeah, I'm here a few years. I'm act I was actually a high school librarian. But anyway, um, I feel like um, I, I worry about the gentrification, but I understand why it's a good idea. I think. Like in, I was looking at our biography section myself and the previous person had like um, scientists, historical people. And I guess I um, was old school where, you know, everything just was one after the other after the other. So that's why I'm here today because I wanted to see what other benefits uh, other than what I have been looking at um, there were. Thank you, Joanne. I can go Alex? next. Uh, my name is Molly. I'm a public librarian. I work out of Hoboken Public Library. We're in the um, Buckles Consortium. And um, our children's section recently went through genrefying. So I was interested in, um, I'm in access services. So trying to see if that would be something that would benefit the adult section. Um, we have like this constant issue. Well, it's not even an issue, but um, we have a lot of people on our team and we all have very varying aspects of like what we read and what we know and it's kind of coming down to a point where I can't recommend the same three mystery novelists anymore because I, I only know three so if you ask me about fantasy I could tell you so just kind of trying to figure out if, if genrefying is something that we want to go through with and proceed with. Um, I'll sort of like reintroduce myself I guess um, you know now I work at library link but in a past life uh, before I came here I was a school librarian in a middle school high school library um, and prior to that i was in public libraries um, in youth services and right now i sort of substitute at the cherry hill public library so i have a lot of varied experience um and i actually was telling lisa i ungenrified my high school library uh when i got there a few years ago um i don't know that i would do the same thing now but at the time I had my reasons and we can get into that uh, if, if the conversation gets there later. But I will say that at Cherry Hill, um, the adult section is sort of separated by like sci-fi 
kind of mystery, you know, um, the fiction section, and then it's alphabetical within those. Um, and it is helpful for someone like me who's only there as a substitute when people come in and say, you know, I need a, a mystery. Like, I don't read mysteries. I don't know anything about mysteries. So it's nice to be able to just kind of go to that section and say, here they are, you know? Um, so I see what you're saying, Molly, for sure. Yeah, hi, I'm Stephanie. I also work at Library Link. Um, I don't know much about genre fying, so I'm here to learn from all of you and get, you know, ideas, advice, inspiration. So I'm just looking for this conversation. Thank you. Um, I will tell you all that another point that was just made in the podcast this past weekend was that um, that your libraries are already genrefied, if you think about it, because fiction is pulled out, fiction is supposed to be in the 800s, biographies are pulled out. So there is a, you know, not to the extent that people are doing today, but if you think about it in those terms also, we're already kind of genrefying to, to a small degree. Um, I also want to mention that my public library, uh, Molly, I'm not sure where in Bergen County you are, but my public library in Old Japan, they genrefied years ago, well before I did, when I was still the uh, against John, like, no, why? I can't believe they did that. How are the kids supposed to find the books? How are they going to find the books? The kids find the books. They know what they're looking for. Um, but yeah, our public library, they, I don't know if the adult section is genrefied, but the kids section definitely is. And they're they're not, I'm not too far from Old Japan, so I could I could take a trip. <laughs> yeah, and actually they're wonderful there, so I'm sure they would be open to you coming to to talk or see them or or whatever. They're they're I love them. They're wonderful. So, yeah. All right. Um, so, is there anyone here who I know? So Molly, you said your children's section is genreified, um, and just me and Molly. Is that it? We actually all. There's 10 branches in our system and in Somerset County. In okay. adults, we had mystery and sci-fi pulled out. And because of all these people writing historical mysteries with fire breathing dragons, it <laughs> we actually just finished this summer smooshing everything back together. We okay. do have stickers on mystery and sci-fi though, so people can see them easily. But it was just getting ridiculous with people writing you know, these mashups or one author writing historical fiction, mysteries, and sci-fi. So we want to make sure somebody can see everything by that author. So we nice. actually un our adult fiction. But we have it all with stickers so you can see what it is. If you don't mind my asking, do you think that the stickers work well? Like, is it something that you would do for other genres? Because we have a lot of romance readers in our in our system as well. Um, so we were thinking definitely sci-fi and mystery because those are the two things that we asked for, but like Colleen Hoover is huge right now and people are like, oh, can you recommend me another romance? And I'm like, I, I can, but I would, you know, there's like 10,000 books over here. So, you know, you go check out the aisles, but I think the stickers would be great for us. So I'm trying to figure out, should we genre buy or should we sticker? <laughs> I, I'm more for stickers, but I'm also a less is more. I would not sticker romance because it's then, is it a romance? Okay, or is it contemporary women's fiction that has romance in it? it you, then you're like putting a sticker on everything. Um, it's really hard with adult fiction materials, I think. I know Albany Public Library, we're talking decades ago, genrefied their whole collection and realized they had to buy multiple copies so they could put it in four or five different places because it fit all those you know checked all those boxes they very quietly put everything back so so i i don't i i think it works great for kids and i've seen it work wonderfully for kids but for adults there's so many well, I don't read that. I, you know, I don't read romance. I read contemporary women's fiction. Yeah, it's it's romance. But I think if you put that romance sticker on there, you're gonna lose those people. So, I don't know. <laughs> no, it's tough. We were. I was also dabbling with like doing shelf talkers for more popular work. So like, if you liked Verity, you could you would like this mm -hmm. or something like that. Which we're, we're trying to figure it out. <laughs> yeah, I think that would work really well. And also, just look for the pink books. Look for the pink books. So yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I think the bottom line for all of this is you have to do what works best for your collection and your population. I think that I don't think there's any one answer or any one right way. Um, 
a, a suggestion was made also in terms of the stickers that when you start the genrefication, because it is, it is time consuming. I literally went through every single book and reread every single book to decide, first of all, what kinds of categories I was going to create and then where I was going to put a book into a category. And then I had a category and then I, I had to switch it out and make smaller categories. And, and it's also, it's a lot of guesswork because it's, well, this could be this or it could be that. So I'm going to put it here and let's see if it gets checked out. And if it doesn't get checked out here, then maybe I need to move it over here. And I, I think also it's, practice not perfection like you just you got to try and if it works great and if it doesn't that's why the stickers might be a good way of a more low-key way to go with your mystery and your sci-fi and your fantasy as without actually moving everything and putting everything in a different section that might be a small way to start but you're right you also don't want to like i know lbgtq books it's recommended do not mark them because especially, especially now, um, that you don't want to bring attention to them or you don't want somebody not to check the book out because they don't want anybody to see that sticker on it. So I guess, unfortunately, romance still has that same kind of connotation too. Yeah. Yeah, I will um, say these, these are like the similar issues that I faced and why I ultimately ungenrified my school library, which was middle school, high school, um, partly because it was so hard for for me to decide which book went where. And once you stuck it in a category, you had those kids that were like, well, I read horror and this is not in the horror section. And I'm like, I promise you, you're gonna like it, but it's in sci-fi and they don't read sci-fi. Right. You know, um, so it got <laughs> really complicated. Um, and because it was just me and the whole district, um, I didn't, ha I couldn't reasonably look that deeply into every book to figure out, well, is it contemporary fiction or is it romance? Is it fantasy? Is it historical fiction? You know, um, it just wasn't always that simple. So well, I ended up- books are a heck of a lot easier to do that way. Yeah, and that's why I think it works so well with picture books. I'm sorry, I said picture books are a heck of a lot easier to do that way than to do yeah. it with chapter books. Yeah, um, so those were some of the issues that I faced, but I think, the flip side to it was you do get those patrons that really want to just come in and go to the horror section or go, you know, um, and, you know, are you doing them a disservice? Like, just because on my end, I wanted to make it easier for myself to like catalog and get, you know, and know where things were. I, I don't know. It, it gets really tricky. Um, the, the bookstore model, the bookstore model, like people always talk about, right, is basically just genrefication, but, um, I find I'm always confused in a bookstore, so I don't know if that's... That's the librarian in you, Darby. <laughs> I think also, the, the, I mean, the new term, this dynamic shelving, I think no matter how your collection is organized, you also think, have to think about how you're displaying your collection and how your patrons are seeing what you have. And again, you know, with the little guys, it just made sense for me. And that's why I started with the picture book section because my older kids have a better idea of what they like. Um, but the little ones never ask for a specific book. It was always the princess books or the ninja books or the scary books or the, and that's why it just made sense for me to do what I did with my collection. Lisa, can I ask you a question? Yeah. Did you have to go back and do a lot of work in your catalog? it wasn't that bad I was able to do batch changes so I could I created all new sublocations so we have everyone fiction princesses and superheroes everyone fiction magical creatures everyone fiction imagination and then what I would go in is I take that pile of books and do a batch update so I would set that category and then just scan all the books and they were all scanned into the new subcategory so everything still has their Dewey information on it uh, the it, it still has that, but it just has a subcategory. And each book, we I created a label for each book, which is more for us for shelving purposes to remember which section to put it back into than it is for the kids to, to notice. And they are still in um, order by author on in within their section. And I 
try to keep like books together. Like um, I have one, my biggest section is favorite char authors and characters. And you know, that's where the Clifford books are and the fly guy books and the froggy books and the biscuit books, because to break those up into categories, I would have lost my mind. <laughs> there was just too many of them. Um, but then I have a section called feelings and mindsets. And there's a collection of books by um, Michael Ian Black and Debbie Ripetho. He there's I'm, I'm bored. I'm worried. Um, I'm sorry is the newest one. And there's one more. I forget what the other one is. And those I put into feeling and mindsets because they all are about feelings. And they're all so even though that could be a favorite author and illustrator, a kid's going to look for it based on the feelings. So that's why I put it in the feelings and mindset section instead of in favorite authors and characters. But for the most part, if we had a large collection of books from any particular author or character, those stay together as favorite authors and characters. Thank you. That is helpful information. I think the cataloging feels overwhelming sometimes when yes. you think about moving your collection around. Yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't too bad with the, the cataloging aspect of it. The, it was more, it was definitely more work pulling every book off the shelf, going through every book, trying to figure out categories. And I know there are some categories I made this year that are going to have to change because the kids just aren't going to go to them. They don't, they, I already, I'm already seeing it. I have a category of adventure books, which I would think, oh, you know, if a kid, but I have to come up with a better name for it. Adventure's not sticking with the kids. Um, they get feelings and mindsets. They get be awesome, be kind. They understand that. But some of them, it was just, these books kind of all went together under this umbrella, but what is a way I can state it that the kids will be asking for it that way or looking for it that way. And I think also once the signs are in place, that's going to help as well because then they'll have a visual. I just need a color printer. <laughs> so, um, has anybody dabbled with it or is there anybody who's like, <coughs> excuse me, there's no way I want to genre -fy, but I'm here to see if you can convince me to do so. <laughs> I'm just looking for ideas, like, especially for nonfiction. Yes, as librarians, we all know what the Dewey means, but I just want to be like, cookbooks. <laughs> yes. So it's like, yeah, this is just where the cookbooks are. Um, so trying to figure out if we have a very small branch, yeah, we're still going to have the Dewey and everything on the books, but being able to merchandise it as, you know, we're only going to have the most popular things in this location. So, you know, cookbooks crafts, gardening, maybe, I don't know. So trying to figure out how we're going to set that up. That's fascinated by this branch. What is this teeny tiny branch that's coming? Like, uh, we're reopening like a neighborhood branch. We just had a large new building open in Montgomery Township. Right. And then the branch that moved is reopening in a smaller footprint. So oh. it's trying to reimagine that space because right now we're going to have like, it's a third of the space. So it's like, okay, if we're going to put a little bit of everything in here, what little bit are we putting in here? And, you know, having a nonfiction section really doesn't make sense when you've only got like eight shelves. So trying to figure out how we're going to do it. We're in the planning stage and I don't even have a footprint yet really. So I, I don't know what I'm doing. So, yeah. I mean, just from personal experience, like we, so I'm actually at one of my other library branches. I'm not at our main branch. I'm at, um, we call it the Grand Street branch. And it's like, basically it used to be a doctor's office. So it's all like these little tiny rooms. And we had to figure out how to designate what to do with all of these little tiny rooms, which is a lot harder than it sounds. So right now it's just book, like bookcases that have, I can even show you, but it's just like bookshelves that have fiction, nonfiction. We have new fiction, new nonfiction biographies on some, like it's just very, it's organized by Dewey and it's organized by author last name and fiction, but it's like, it's just, you have this very minimal amount of space and you have to figure out what your, what your patrons are looking for and how to best classify everything. It's like, it, it is a struggle, especially when you're dealing with limited amount of spaces. So I can sympathize with that. And we were considering genre playing maybe just over here at first to see how it fared because there's only a couple of bookshelves 
of nonfiction over here and fiction. So to see how it maybe did in a smaller space setting rather than like the bigger, bigger library branch that we have. Um, because eventually we'll have a third branch that opens up that's also going to be limited in spacing. So we're trying to we're trying to organize everything now and figure out if it's worth it for us to genreify maybe the smaller spaces um, and maybe just leave the big big library spaces alone. So we are on the same page. <laughs> I have to say, I'm glad you brought up about nonfiction because that is part of my frustration with the nonfiction section. Like again, if the kids want a book on elephants, why aren't all the elephant books together? Some are, you know, some are separated because the author's last names are different. And I get that. And, but some are, you know, it's because the topic is elephants, but it's elephants doing this. And the topic is elephants, but it's elephants doing that. In a, in a primary school, they just want a book on elephants. They don't care. And so, but my non, like, I think doing nonfiction is, is going to be humongous and I'm a little scared of it. <laughs> so it was easier to start with the picture book section. Um, but I, I should know Dewey better than I do. Um, but that that is a frustration that I have that also led me to want to do this because it's just like I just want all those books together for the kids to find. Uh, and I don't does think that's unique to kids. Like I think <laughs> adults also want <laughs> to go into the library and and get you know their travel books and all of the country from the you know and ideally in Dewey they should be, but I feel like it doesn't always work out that way for some reason we there's always an outlet to work yeah like um our embroidery and knitting books are very popular but like it goes classified by author and then you know like the way the dewey is set up so you know you may find like two books of embroidery together and then there's 10 books of knitting and then you've got two more books on embroidery so they're like really not together like you would want them to be especially if somebody's looking like i'm trying to learn this new thing and i now i need to like go and we have our catalog but we're in an older library so we have to like come back downstairs to get to the catalog and then go back up because the building's from 1890 so it's not it's not ideal um so you know it's like do do we genreify in, in that way with the nonfiction? like do we put those those books together to make people's lives a little bit easier especially the cookbooks um i know that that was somebody something was brought up already about that. I know the cookbooks are a big one. So it's like, do we avoid fiction? Because like fiction, it could be a little bit more touch and go and just genre by nonfiction because that's mm -hmm. pretty, it's pretty straightforward. <laughs> Does anyone have any Thing that they're concerned about or just any questions in general about the process or anything that you would like to touch on? No? Lisa, I'm curious if you had trouble getting your faculty on, like your teachers on board or I mean, I know in, a, in a public I library, it would be a little different, but I, I have worked in a public library and I imagine that there are those folks who want to keep Dewey forever. So did you have to do a lot of convincing? Um, I just did it. And then when school started, I said, by the way, this is how the picture book section is now organized. Because I have to say for most of the time, I do have some teachers who would come in and they know the specific section of where their books are. But I have found that there's a lot of adults who don't know how to use a library the right way. Um, and and even before I became a librarian, like, I don't know, I just thought it was second nature for most people that you knew how a library was set up and you used it. But I do have teachers who don't even realize how the library is set up. So I don't even know that it they would have noticed that things were changed, except for the fact that the books they were looking for weren't in the same spot that they were always in. Um, yeah, I do get a lot of a lot of kickback when I'm weeding. I have a whole cart of books that are being, you're getting rid of those books? Why are you getting rid? Do you see the mold on them? Do you see it hasn't been checked out since 1995? Like it, it, nobody wants this book. You want it? Here, have it. 
And I, I actually, I was blessed with a renovation. Ha <laughs> ha! In two thousand fall of two thousand nineteen, um, we did a, a renovation. So prior, so that June again, I did a whole bunch of weeding, and we used to have big books. We had big books that took. We had close to three hundred big books that took up a big space in my library, and. Um, nobody, ch I mean, if 10 big books went out a year, it was a lot. So when we were doing the renovation, we decided, well, there's no point in keeping them here. Nobody's really using them, but we offered them to the staff. We were like, here, if you want the big books, take them. The slack I got from people about getting rid of the big books was unbelievable. But I said, I'm not getting rid of them. If you use it and you want it, take it. It's yours. And I, you know, one person I almost got into a fight with, I'm like, when's the last time you checked out a big book? Like, when's the last time you took one? Why should I be housing them and taking up priority space when nobody's using them? So, yeah, I think, again, with the library, it, public pri uh, school, people don't really know what it's all about. And they, they again, we're not an archive. We're, you know, we're not here to keep books all the time. And I just finally bought a book on weeding because I want to be able to say to somebody, here, here's the reasons why I'm weeding. <laughs> Would you like to read it? And, and I, I know it comes from a good place and I know they mean well because they just, oh, they're books, they're wonderful. But that, I think out of everything, that's what I've gotten the biggest pushback on is weeding books that nobody checks out. Yeah. Including I usually the ask patrons, patrons. I, I've had people when I was out in the stacks, you know, I can't believe, you know, what are you doing with those? And I'm like, they're going away. And I do the, would you want to touch this sort of thing? Um, and then I also ask them if they're willing to make a $2 million donation for the addition. And because this one person just wouldn't stop. And I was like, okay, frankly, do you have this? And they're looking at me like, I don't understand why you're asking me this question. I'm like, where are we going to put like we're still getting new books because you want to obviously get new books. Where are we going to put it all? And then once I put it that way, it was like the light bulb went off. Oh yeah, get rid of that gross, smelly thing I never want to touch. Yeah, like yeah, there's a reason. So that's what I usually do. It's like where you know new stuff's coming in. Where are you going to put it? So yeah, I understand your frustration. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and and um, the kids the kids have taken very quick to to the sections. They still again because the signage isn't there. They still will ask, wait, where are the princess books again, or where are this? But it makes it so much easier for them to find what they are looking for. Yeah. All right. So uh, I want to make sure I'm going to do this so I don't forget. So I'm going to share um, the wakelet I made with you, and it's actually. You, if you come across anything that you want to add in, you can add to this wakelet as well. So it's not just a closed wakelet, like there's all stuff there and you can add additional um, things to it if you would like, if you come across anything while you're doing it. And even, you know, pro genrefying or reasons not to genrefy because I think, no, but I know this is all about genrefication, but I also think, like we were saying, that the main goal is you have to look at your patronage and you have to look at your collection and you have to do what's going to work best for them and what's going to get the books out. I mean, even when book before I genrefied, like books would come in and I love the, the Babysitter's Club, the graphic novels. Well, Anne Martin wrote the original ones, but this one was written by this person and this one was written by this person. So now those are going to be all over. Uh -uh. We put the kibosh on it. They all say Martin on them. I know Anne Martin didn't necessarily write that particular one, but it's based on what she wrote. And that's how the kids are going to find it. I think the bottom line is you have to do what's going to help your patronage find what they're looking for. And that's something we've done, like Curious George all goes under Curious George or something like that, just so all of that lands together. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah and I think that's really common which is why it's kind of funny i think sometimes we do feel really resistant to genrefying but so much is already genrefied like lisa in my library i mean i ungenrefied but i also pulled out all the graphic novels and comics and put them in one section mm -hmm. because they were so popular that kids just wanted that's just what they wanted to find you know um so i think we are do sometimes we're doing genrefication without even really realizing it or thinking about it um, and, and you're right, like 
so I used to have those babysitter club books in my library too. And I ended up just changing it to like babysitters club or something on the right. label because, you know, they're by six different people or whatever. And the kids don't care who it's by. Right. They just want the book. The next book in the series. Yeah. And something I did that I'm still, I'm not a hundred percent comfortable with it. And, but I still, until I can come up with a better way, Pokemon. I want a Pokemon book. Well, we have nonfiction Pokemon books. We have graphic novel Pokemon books. We have fiction Pokemon books. We have everyone fiction Pokemon books. All the Pokemon books are just together under favorite authors and characters because again, it just, to, it drives me crazy and it just, it works easier. I'm not comfortable with mixing the nonfiction and the fiction because I think when we're trying to teach the kids the setup of the library and how to locate things that's throwing a clink into it like but wait a minute mrs strawinger is this book nonfiction? because it's in the everyone fiction section so what so that i'm not comfortable with but at the moment it's just what's working best right now so until i can come up with a better solution all the pokemon books are together and and i think that's something that's taken me a while to get comfortable with i guess i've been doing this 10 years now, 11 years now, that it's okay to change things. Like you, you, it's all right. You don't have to keep stuff in the place where it comes cataloged. Like I know the book came with that sticker on it, but if you think it's going to work better in a different section, like we just got, we just got a book on voting, a picture book on voting and it was nonfiction, but it's an alphabet book. So it's each letter of the alphabet and a concept about voting for each letter of the alphabet. So I said, it, nobody's going to, they're not going to find it in nonfiction. They're not going to be looking for that book in nonfiction, but I have a section called letters, numbers, and shapes, and all the other alphabet books are there. So we moved it and we put it with the alphabet books because I want it to be where it's going to be found. Has anyone else ever done that? Completely changed the... I took a nonfiction book and made a fiction. <laughs> okay, come on. I'm giving my dirty little secret. Somebody you else. You're not the only one, I'm sure. I mean, I'm, I'm sure we've ever. done it. It's just, I'm on the adult side of things, so I, I, I don't know, but I, I am positive that it has happened. Yeah. <laughs> So if you, even as a public librarian, um, Kelsey Bogan, she's, I'm, I'm fairly new to her, but she has a blog and it's called Don't Shush Me. Um, and she's very big on TikTok. And I think she, for me personally, she's given me a lot of aha moments and a way to look at, <laughs> that's, Stephanie says she's still listening, but her cat is a little vocal today. <laughs> so I guess she's got some meowing going on in the background. <laughs> yes. um, and she just had a hairball, so I was cleaning it up. That's why I like Oh no! <laughs> so. um, but she's just given me a lot of aha moments and a lot of, of ways to look at things differently than how I had been seeing them. And I appreciate that. I, I appreciate being given the opportunity to think of things in a different way. I may not even I, I may not end up agreeing with it in the end, but I I like the fact that I was giving a different perspective and, and seeing something in a different way. So just in general, not just genreification, but she's she's been the big push behind. She has a lot of like TikTok videos about a lot of the issues with Joey. Um, a lot of the there's some racism issues and some and things like that that are just inbred in the system from when it was created. And she just it's a way to support her cause for not using it as well. Or, or, or stepping away from it or changing the way that she catalogs things because she wants to make it better for her student population. So. And I, I and, will say on that note that we, and I'll, I'd have to check and see if it's still up, but almost a year ago now, maybe not quite a year ago, we did one of these conversations on bias in the catalog. Um, and it was all about sort of how to address it and how you can sort of recatalog things to make them less biased and some systems that are out there that people are working on for sort of addressing those issues. So I think you can still find it on our YouTube channel. I'm pretty sure. Um, I'll maybe maybe I'll send it out when I send out the follow up email to this um, to this conversation, so you can watch the recording. But you're rightly so. I think that that we haven't even touched on that yet. But that 
is a driving force for some folks to go to genrefication because they want to get away from some of the systems that are, you know, considered to have like bias built into them. And then I think you run up against that issue of like we talked about earlier, not wanting to sticker, for example, like um, LGBTQ books. Um, and I don't know about the rest of you, but I know my high schoolers would always ask me for books like, you know, those books. Oh, I want, I want a gay book. That's what they do. I want a gay book. Um, you know, why don't we have a section? And it's kind of like, I don't know that I, that it makes sense to make a section, you know, because then you're running into your, the, your own issues of, as you said, Lisa, like issues of, um, people maybe keeping wanting to keep things confidential or, you know, right. um, whatever it is. So I'm curious if anyone is grappling with that too, when you think about genrefying, like what sections you'll actually create or whether there are issues behind it. I guess you probably didn't run into that at, at an elementary school. Oh, that may be, I don't know. Um, I didn't, when I was genrefying, I didn't, I, I don't have any, I don't know, lack of a better word, more like, I guess at a middle school, high school level, the books are more explicitly, you know, at this level, it's more about just be who you are and it's okay, whoever that is. You know, I do have, I do have, you know, some books that I know are out there on banned book lists, but like, I think it's a stretch for the connections some people are making to consider it a book that should be banned. Um, I do, when it comes to scary books, like the Goosebump books or um, I have a couple books that you know, I have a scary section in everyone fiction, which is open to everybody. But then I have some chapter books and things that are a little on the creepier side. And I tell I do tell my K1s that they're welcome to check them out. But first, they have to bring me a note from home that says it's OK for you to take home scary books, because I have had problems in the past where a kid has brought a book home and the parent is like, why does my child have this book? And, and I understand that. I, I get that as with the, with the little guys. So it's not that they can't have it. They just, and I've had kids, I've had two or three kids who brought me notes from home that said, it's okay for so-and-so to check out scary books. And then they're free to take whatever they want because the parent has given that permission. It's not a system in place. I, I also have to say that I'm very torn between a public librarian and a school librarian. I think there are different responsibilities in terms of checkout and and um, what you what you allow who to take from your collection. But that being said, I would never stop a child from taking a book that they wanted. Or I don't know. I'm, I I feel like I'm stepping on my words now. Um, I think it's a fine line. Um, a lot, I, I do refrain a little bit from my little guys checking out stuff that is meant for the older kids. And I know that's a total judgment call on my part, but I also work in a district that is very upper middle class. Um, these kids are not lacking for books at home. Um, many times my favorite is when a kid checks out a book and tells me, oh, I have this book at home. And I say, okay. So why are you checking it out from here? Because I really love it and I want to have it in school to read it. Okay, fine. No problem, whatever. Um, but I would say the only, that's the only place where I'm, I'm hesitant about books is with my scary book collection that I do ask the kids. And, and when a kid really wants the book, they're going to go home and say to their parent, can you write a note to Mrs. Straubinger and tell her that it's okay for me to check out these kind of books? And, and this way, if, if the parent has a question about, well, what's the scary book? And then I can have that conversation prior to the book going home. And because some of them have, do you remember, I'm, I'm showing my age here. Um, oh gosh. It, it's something scary stories. Like it had the scary story about the woman with the green velvet ribbon around her scary neck. Stories to tell in the dark. Yes. So, just the pictures now they're not really scary stories but when you look at the illustrations in that book i think my own kids i would have been shocked if they would have brought that home so something like that i i feel like okay check with mom and dad and let them tell let them tell me that it's okay for you to take this home the stories themselves are harmless but the the illustrations are creepy and i had two kinds of kids my older son he scares stuff never bothered him. He was fine. He could have been reading that stuff whenever he, nothing frightened him, didn't scare him. He loves that kind of stuff. My younger son, he was, he's still afraid of some stuff. Like he's still, you know, and 
And that's why I also think it depends from kid to kid. So I will have kids sometimes who I know that would be fine with the scary book, but their friend wants it too. And I know the friend's not going to be fine with that scary book. So that's kind of why that's in place. But once they hit second grade, it's, it's whatever. So if that makes me a bad librarian, I apologize, but that's what works for, for our school system. I don't think it makes you a bad librarian, Lisa. And, and I, I will say when I was in the middle school, high school, I mean, a middle school, high school library is like, you know, a sixth grader and a high school senior could are like world, like universes apart. Yeah. You know, we had 11 year olds coming in and we, some of these kids were graduating at 19, 20, right? Um, depending on family circumstances and stuff. So I also had a similar system where there were some of the books were high school books and they had to have a permission slip signed if they were in sixth or seventh grade to be able to take high school books. Once they got it signed one time, that was it. It wasn't per book. Mm -hmm. It was like, yes, permission. Um, in the public I library- I do it every year. Like I have a child who brought me the note in kindergarten and he yeah. didn't have to bring it again this year because we're good. But I see what you're saying. I, you know, I always felt like um, I would get flack from my public library colleagues a little bit because I do understand, but in the public library, we would always say, well, it's your responsibility to come with your child and, right. and know what they're checking yeah. out. In the school library, we would say, you absolutely cannot come here with your child. You, you are not welcome in the school building in the middle of the day to see what they check out. So the rules are a little grayer, right. you know, that you, you kind of have to take that in loco parentis to heart. Um, whereas in the public library, I don't, I don't think. Um, well, you're not going to get a kindergarten or a first grader in a public library by themselves. Typically not. Um, typically. Yeah, typically. Yeah. Um, but I will say it it led to issues for me with the with the classification with the genrefication because then we would get teachers who would say, well, why don't you just have a middle school section and a high school section, right? Um, why don't you just break them apart? But then there's a crossover, right? And you got into this issue where you had high schoolers with low reading levels, and do they want to go over to the middle school section because they can't read the high, you know? um all that stuff so I never did that they were just they had little stickers in the back cover if they were high school so that it was very um you know not noticeable but um you know I do think you can go too far with mm -hmm. trying to cl classify things into little cubbies too so something to think about yeah Joanne, have you had any issues with books in your collection since you're K-3 also? Uh, no, not really. Um, like I said, I'm only here a, a few years in K-3. Um, one thing I, I do notice is this collection is very old. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, I have been doing weeding. And when I, I listen about your 20 hours, see, we, I don't get that. So doing a job like that is probably going to be very time consuming yeah um you know because there's no i mean i even have now books that um that have to be cataloged that didn't come processed because people gave them to me or whatever and even that little job takes a long time when you have a checkout library you know well i'm a special so you right. know, I, I have kids you know all day long so um but the, this collection is very old like i'm trying to as i get some new books i'm putting them on the shelf and looking what's around it so I could see what I can get rid of. We also do that. We need to make room weeding that. Yeah. Okay. We just guarded some new books and now I can't fit them on the shelf. All right. What's going <laughs> and, yeah, and I mean, there's always something to go. There is, I mean, as, as much as certain books are great and you have a, a connection to them from when you were a kid, like I had a Richard scary book, and I loved Richard Scarry when I was little, but the book was beat up. It was old. Mm -hmm. I never seen anybody check it out and I had to let it go. <laughs> I know what you mean. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, but it is, I, that's why I wanted to start the conversation with the fact that I was supported by my district in doing this project, mm -hmm. because it is not something that can easily be done during the day, especially when you're a special and if you don't get any library support periods, if you, right. if you only get your planning periods and you're teaching classes the whole rest of the day, that's right. Where's the time to do something like this? Yeah, Whereas really, if, if you want to, you know, like I, I listen to podcasts, if you want to do something different or change, 
there's just I don't get anything but my own prep period. So there's just no time, which is sad because there's there are so many things that, you know, I would be able to change in here. But without the time, you really can't do that. I think, I mean, one way, if you were considering it as new stuff was coming in, maybe you could label it um, and that would at least make it easier to locate. But again, you know, then half your collection is labeled and half your collection is in and right. it's, yeah. And it, yeah. it is a big job. It is yeah. definitely a big job. Yeah. But I do recommend, I, I did put the newest, um, thing that I added to the the wakelet was the podcast from this past weekend. And I do recommend listening to it. Um, and Amy Herman is amazing at including all the resources in her show notes. And she linked to the other um, podcast that she's done with Kelsey Bogan and she re linked to her uh, blog and all of that. So the links, even if you don't listen to the podcast and you just check out all the show notes, but I do, I, I do recommend if you're thinking about this or just have more questions about it, I do recommend listening to it because it, I, I found it very helpful. Okay. Thank you. And I'm looking through this wakelet, Lisa. It's so extensive. So thank you for that. <laughs> Well, it's easy to like Google, you know, wakelet, I mean, uh, genrefication and find stuff to just throw in there. So it was, it was easy to do. Um, but I hope it's helpful. And a lot of it was my own research because this, so we do something, um, we have the option as a tenure teacher to not be observed. And we do something called an SDGP. Um, so we develop a, a study that we're going to do. And that was, that was my study from last year was researching the possibility of genrefication and how it would affect our library. So again, through my school, I was given time for that. So I'm very lucky to have that too. Okay. We have a few more minutes, but anything else before we wrap up? We were a small group, but everyone had great ideas and comments. So I appreciate that. I want to come see these tiny libraries. <laughs> I, can't I love the idea of a tiny library. Yeah, we want to come see it when it's open, Yvonne. OK, hopefully, in. well, that's the other question. I don't know exactly <laughs> when that's happening either. Um, but sometime in 2023, it will open, so. Okay. I hear rave things about the new, big new branch. You know, everybody has good things to say. It is very cool. It is very, yeah. very cool. I apologize. My cat just came over and he's purring very loudly. Um, so it's yeah. A it's a cat day. Day. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. Well, Lisa, anything else for us before I just kind of wrap it up? Yes. I have to know how many of the librarians on this call have cats? Because I have cat. <laughs> Okay. I was like, oh no, is it really a stereotype that librarians all have cats? <laughs> I think for the most part it is true. Oh, you're so cute. I'm a dog You're person. like, no, I'm walking across my keyboard. I, I, you know what, Molly? I agree with you. I am a dog person, but I, I don't have a dog because I feel like, I always say I feel like dogs the way I feel about swimming pools. Like I just want other people it's to more have work. <laughs> and I want to go to your house and enjoy it. And then yeah. I want to go home and not take care and of them. <laughs> um, so my sister has a dog and a swimming pool. So like, it's so cool. like her. There you go. <laughs> um, okay. So on that note, uh, <laughs> thank you guys all so much for being here. This was a really fun conversation. Um, we do skill sharing conversations once a month. Um, they are on wildly various topics. Uh, so next month, Stephanie, seed library. Seed libraries. Yeah. November. So if May. you're looking yeah, if you're looking to start a seed library and lend out seeds, uh, join us um, in November. And then in December, we will be talking about book clubs and book groups oh. and how to keep them exciting and keep them going and all that kind of stuff. Okay. Um, and that's as far as we've planned. But we, we typically do it once a month. Um, and we hope that you will join us again. And if you have a topic uh, that you want to moderate, see how easy it was? I don't know, Lisa, if you thought it was easy, but I think it's actually Darby. I kind of feel like you did a lot of the work. <laughs> um, you made it very easy. Um, we may we try to make it easy. So if you have a topic or something that you're passionate about that you want to talk about that you want to share, you can um, let myself or Stephanie know our, our information will be in the follow up email. 
Um, and then you can host your own skill sharing conversation, which will be very short. So um, anything else before we go, y'all? I'm just putting my email address in the chat in case anybody has any questions. Please don't hesitate to reach out. Feel free to reach out with any questions. I don't know if I can answer them, but I will try. Great. All right. Well, thank you so much, everyone. Um, Joanne, I'll be in touch with okay. your certificate. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. All right. Have a thank good one. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.